Okay, let's get moving on to a new order this week. We are looking at the Blatodia. So remember, we've been looking at a whole bunch of different uh, insect orders, things that you are likely to see out in the big bad world. This is one you will definitely see. And I might get into this a little bit more later on. So the Blatodia. Blatodia is from the Greek word for cockroach. So we're talking about an insect that has been around for so long, instead of using Greek and Latin to describe what it looks like, we just use the Greek and Latin for that word, for what they called it back in the original Greek. So Blatodia is Greek for cockroach. It's also known as a, a variety of different names. I mean, think about the names that you've called cockroaches before. One that comes to mind for me is uh, the water bug. And the only reason I bring this up is because I actually worked a case with cockroaches a while back where they just kept saying, hey, there were water bugs all over this body or there were water bugs around this body. And this case was in Vegas, like behind a casino right off the the main strip. So I was thinking like, what? how are there a bunch of water bugs? Because when I think water bugs, I think hemiptera, which I'll show you a little bit later. But hemiptera are true bugs and they are found in water. And so we call them water bugs. That seems to make sense. So this didn't make any sense at all. It took a while to figure it out. And this is one of the reasons why I really, really preach even if you are not studying insects, even if you know very, very little about them, I want you to know their proper names so that we don't get these weird common name confusions that take weeks to figure out because nobody understands what the other person is saying. Okay, I'll stop ranting, I guess. Now, these cockroaches are most abundant in tropical or subtropical climates. So for those of you who live down south in where it's nice and warm, you know these things are abundant. As you get going up north, you, you tend to see fewer, especially outdoor cockroaches. You see more of the maybe invasive species. You see a few that come inside, but they don't live a lot outside and you just don't get nearly as many that actually invade your home. Now their overall their overall uh, body form is oval and they have a flattened body adapted for running and squeezing into narrow openings. Yeah, you you also know this, right? So much of the head is covered by a large plate of exoskeleton called the pronotal shield. So when I talk about the pronotal shield, that's this little triangular part right here, that right there. So remember the pronotum, that's that first section of the thorax, and it's covered by a shield so that the head and mouth parts can kind of tuck underneath that shield. You see the head's tucking right there and gives them some good protection from going under things. Now, when these cockroaches lay their eggs, they produce a special capsule around the eggs known as an oothecum or an oothecum for plural. That's what this is. So these oothecum, that's what you can see, it closing right here. Look how adorable those little guys are. Okay, so these oothecum, they are uh, there to protect the egg. So here's the female producing an oothecum right there. So that way she can lay the eggs, she can oviposit the eggs wherever they will best be protected. So it's super, super sclerotized. Basically, you see all these ridges here? There's one or two eggs per ridge just sitting upwards. You can almost see them right there. See how translucent that is? So they're just sitting upwards. So her entire clutch of eggs is like in this little purse right here that she's gonna carry around. And depending on the species, she will lay these eggs in the ground, she'll lay them near um, water, she'll lay them near foodstuffs. If they're inside your home, they're either going to be near water, so near your sink, under your sink, something like that. Maybe they might be glued places. This is one of the ways that cockroaches can get inside. So remember back to our basic um, urban entomology talk, uh, many, many weeks ago, where I talked about how these different species can glue these oothecum inside. Yeah, so that's what's going on here. Now, these have uh, parametabolous metamorphosis. So the young will hatch out of the oothecum into the first instar nymphs. And they need to uh, sclerotize very quickly before they move along. So they'll sclerotize and they'll go out and do what they need to do. Now, the uh, Blutodia are scavengers. So they feed on whatever 
whatever they can get their little mandibles on right there. And so they, we tend to see them in decomposing situations. So they will show up on bodies. We do see them on dead bodies. So we see them feeding on the skin or on the hair of these bodies. The, uh, um, damage that is left behind by these cockroaches is specific. So it looks a lot like burn marks on a body instead of big chunks or something like that. So uh, when we talk about cockroaches and a dead body, I'll show you that. Now these, uh, Really, there's only about 12 species worldwide that are considered actual pests. Most of the cockroaches you're going to run into are outdoors. And they will run around outdoors and be undead bodies outdoors and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and actually, there is one particular species of cockroach, the Madagascar hissing cockroach, that makes fantastic pets. So uh, they will force air out of their tracheal system, produce a hissing sound that scares predators, but they don't have large mandibles. They don't even have wings, so they can't fly. They're super slow moving. And so they make fantastic pets. Highly recommend them. Now, this is something that I have uh, told you about before. Um, this, remember back to when I was talking about the antennae, I believe I mentioned this. This is, we can actually turn cockroaches into uh, robots. So this is a company called Backyard Brains, and they do all this really crazy stuff. So what they've done here is they have snipped off the antennae of these cockroaches. And they have replaced them with these leads in the cockroaches. And look, he's got a um, an app where you can actually control this cockroach. And what's going on here is because of these uh, electrodes that are in their antennae right now, their antennae are used as touch sensors. So it's basically sending a little electrical shock into those antennae. Okay? And when you say you know, it's go left or go right, it's giving a shock to that opposite antennal uh, node, to that antennae, and it's telling the cockroach, oh, I ran into something, I gotta turn the other way. And so it's moving the cockroach in that manner. How awesome is that? You can just buy these online. Oh, the internet rules. All right, now on to uh, the isoptera. The isoptera, are actually a part of Blatodia now. So it used to be, and in many of your books, in your references that you'll be reading, all that sort of stuff, Isoptera will be treated as its own order called Isoptera. Now, however, it is an infraorder of cockroaches, of Blatodia. So Isoptera actually falls into the Blatodia. So termites are what we call social cockroaches. They evolved from ancestral solitary cockroaches some 150 million years ago, at least 50 million years before bees, ants, and wasps did their own social caste system. So they used to be their own order, Isopt Isoptera, now they're an infraorder. Now, before I get into Isoptera proper, let me talk about this whole infraorder idea for a moment. Okay, remember back in the very beginning of the semester, I told you about the basic names of level t uh, of taxon taxonomy? I used this list right here, right? We looked at the kingdom phylum class, order, family, genus, and species. 
Well, as you might already realize, things get way more complicated than that. I said that nature doesn't like being put in a box, and she really, really doesn't. So once we determine the kingdom, the phylum, the class, etc., for an organism, we sometimes realize we need to get a little bit more detailed about where these uh, individuals fall within these major taxonomy, taxonomy, that was hard, taxonomic groups. Okay, so this is where the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature comes in. So this is literally a large body of people, zo zoologists and uh, taxonomists and people, and their job is to create a code, the international code of zoological nomenclature. Uh, it is the accepted convention in zoology. So these are the rules, the formal naming rules for organisms, all organisms that are treated as animals. And the group works uh, through the most uh, bureaucracy and Robert's Rules of Orders and all this. It's just a, it's crazy long meetings and all this sort of stuff where they have come up with an extremely long, extremely in-depth and rather boring document that lays out exactly how to name an organism. So if you are getting into the naming of new species, you will go through this document and you will follow the guidelines and you will properly categorize and name the species. So all of those things that I tell you, you know, the uh, genus and the species need to be italicized. The genus is uppercase. The species is lowercase. They have this binomial uh, naming, which is the genus and species together. All that, that is written down by this International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. So they sat down and figured this all out and said, this is how we're going to name the species. When you first learn about classification, you get a very simplistic version of this, though. You get what I showed you on the left. In reality, the classification of organisms that we use now looks much more like this on the right. So we start with our kingdom. We got our phylum a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. We got our class. And then we start breaking up the individual groups into smaller groups. Okay? Uh, so they can be broken up tinier and tinier. So just this is more of what we're looking at. We got a class, we got subclass, we got infraclass, we got order, we got suborder, we got infraorder, that isn't even on there. We got superfamily, family, subfamily, tribe, genus, species, subspecies, variety. So when you look at things like subclass, infraclass, those things are smaller groups within that class. Order, suborder, infraorder are smaller groups within that order. The superfamily is below order but above family. You know, a subfamily, just below family. Tribe, which is uh, above genus, but below family. Subspecies is the uh, same species, but they're slightly differentiated. Variety is even smaller than that. So you, it gets really, really complex in there. And this gives people a chance to have a much more precise clarification of organisms or classification of organisms. It allows us to describe their relationships better just through their names. So when you see, say, a variety of an organism or a subspecies, you know that they are really closely related at, at the species level, so much so that they probably haven't split off from each other that long ago. So we're talking, you know, up at the uh, order of group. They split off, you know, 50 or 150 million years ago. At maybe the subspecies of the varietal group, maybe it's only 10 million or 5 million or 1 million years ago. Who knows? You know, so it's just, it gives us that idea that things are much more closely related and uh, it can help us understand their relationships in the world. However, because this is so complex and because, uh, a lot of this information isn't exactly useful in the field. We tend to stick with the one on the right, the one that I taught you. And this is one of the reasons that I teach it to you at the beginning. This is one of the reasons you get it in a bunch of your classes is because it is very good for uh, the applied side of entomology and zoology. So unless I'm really, really interested in the evolution or the relationship of insects. Let's say I'm, I'm looking at, oh, I don't know, the honeybee and the Africanized honeybee. You've heard about those. So there, one is uh, Apis mellifera mellifera. So that is, Apis is the genus, uh, mellifera is the species, mellifera is the subspecies. So Apis mellifera mellifera, subspecies, and then it's Apis mellifera, 
Oh, I forget what the subspecies of the Africanized one is. But um, you can see with those names, you can say, oh, I see. So this Apis mellifera mellifera is the purebred European honeybee. Apis mellifera, whatever, is the the honeybee was bred with the, the uh, African uh honeybee the european honeybee and the african honeybee and this is what came out came out of it so that naming gives us an idea like oh no, no i see this is really really recent and this is just a subspecies so that's what we're doing there but for the most part you don't need to know how super duper related up at say the super family or the subfamily or whatever is um it is so those of us who work in the field on the more applied side of entomology, we find that the simple version of things work just fine, at least for most things. So that is uh, why I have you use or why I have you know this simplistic version. If you get into higher entomology classes, if and when you do, especially when we start talking about classification of organisms, you will have to get to know the infra class, the infra order, the suborder, blah, 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 all of that up and down. But for now, just know this kingdom phylum class or phylum genus species unless you have a specific reason to know something. And for this class, that specific reason is the infra order. Okay, so in May 2018, things got all shaken up in taxonomy. So for a long time, Isoptera was its own order. Uh, we broke, we named it based on its look, just like we do a lot of these uh, orders. Iso means equal, Terra means wings. So in this case, those winged insects have these equal wings. And the, their wings are equal in length. If you see them right here, look at that. So they've got four wings, two pairs of wings. They're exactly the same size, equal weight. Pretty straightforward, right? May 2018 came around and they uh, a big paper came out uh, in Nature, I believe it was, where uh, they sequenced, they annotated, and they analyzed the genomes of the German cockroach and the drywood termite. So two very, very common cockroaches and termites, two species. And then they compared these genomes with 15 other insect species outside of uh, these two that were really far away or what looked like they were closely related based on their literature search. What this paper showed was a distinct relationship between cockroaches and termites. It actually showed that termites had remnants of certain genes that are found in extant cockroaches. When I say extant, that means cockroaches that are out there in the, in the wild right now. So there are these genes having to do with chemoreception and with sight and that sort of thing. And they had a specific look. They had a specific job in cockroaches, and they're just not seeing them in any other organism. They found that, that termites had remnants of these genes, like they had them before, and then they lost them for some reason. When comparing with all these other insect species, no other insect species had even remnants of that gene, let alone uh, any, any show that they used to use them. Okay, so that showed the... Um, the researchers that it looks like or it supported the idea that that termites evolved from cockroaches that really termites are just social cockroaches and this has been played around with in the literature for a while based on their caste system based on their look based on a whole bunch of things uh, people have been playing around with the idea that cockroaches and termites are super duper related for a while now um it wasn't until this paper showing actual evidence, though, that termites have lost some of these genes that they used to have when they were uh, less evolved, shall we say, that the uh, group got together, the nomenclature group got together. and Oh, OK, now we have enough information looking at this, plus all the other stuff over the years. Termites are actually cockroaches. So what they do, they are in the order Blatodia, but they're in the infra order Isoptera. So keep that in mind as you read your book, as you read other things, that this infra order is Isoptera. All right, so let's talk about the cockroaches a little bit. They have chewing mouth parts, just like the uh, cockroaches. So um, the termites look a lot like cockroaches. And if you think about the way where cockroaches live, they live usually in your walls or behind things in big groups. It's really a small leap to get to what we call this caste system. So termites are 
uh, social creatures. They live, they have this caste system. This caste system means that every individual has a job. They break up these groups into workers or soldiers or two or more types of reproductives. So the workers are very pale. They look like white ants. So if you ever have somebody going, oh, I broke up on a log and there were a whole bunch of these white ants out there. They, they saw termites. Okay, so they, they're very pale. They will feed. They will build the nests. They will build the colonies. They will take care of the young. They're the workers. The soldiers, on the other hand, they have these really large sclerotized heads, really big mandibles. Their job is to protect the colony. And so if something comes in to attack, the soldiers go out and protect. Oftentimes you'll see a bunch of workers running around with a few soldiers to protect them out there because the workers have smaller mouth parts, smaller mandibles. They're not nearly as good at protecting themselves. Now, there are two uh, or more types of reproductives depending on the species of termite. Primary reproductives, they are the winged insects. These are what look like winged ants. Notice how sclerotized they are. They're much darker than the unsclerotized workers. So they've got these wings and their job is to pair up male and female. They fly away from a big colony and then they go and they establish a new colony. Once they establish this new colony, they will chew off their wings and then they, the female will lay 60 to 80 eggs over two years. So she's finding a new place to set up a house and then eventually e either she'll die and a new queen will take her place or she'll become the queen or whatever. Now, secondary reproductives. Those secondary reproductives are born after the uh, primary reproductives have a well established the colony. There's some workers, there's some soldiers, we're getting going. Then a secondary reproductive will come up and she will stay within the colony and she gets huge. This is a secondary reproductive. So here's her little head and thorax. Notice it looks a lot like these. Her abdomen though, dear Lord. And that is just all eggs. So she is ginormous, this big grub-like thing. And she will lay 60 to 80 eggs per day. So she goes nuts. All those little things around her, those are workers, you know, caring for her, cleaning her, giving her food, moving her where she needs to go, all that sort of stuff. Now, something else that's interesting about these uh, cockroach types, these termites, is they have, uh, at least certain species, have bacterial symbiotes in their digestive system that allow them to feed on cellulose and plants. And they pass on these digestive uh, symbiotes, these bacterial symbiotes, by doing a thing called anal feeding. So every time they shed their exoskeleton, they go through their instars, they're going to lose these bacterial symbiotes in their hindgut. So they have to go and feed on the anal secretions of their sisters in order to get those uh, bacteria. That lump on the side of this tree in the Amazon? It's packed with termites. In the rainforest, that's a good thing. They break down wood into stuff other creatures can eat. But inside our homes, termites are pests. They cost us billions of dollars of damage every year. Take these damp wood termites that live on the cool California coast. They eat wood that's wet or decayed, maybe from a leak in your house. Slowly but surely, they gnaw and scrape away. What comes out the other end isn't waste. It serves as a kind of mortar. And dried poop pellets make perfect building blocks for their nests. In other words, they're turning your house into theirs. What's amazing is that they can digest wood, which is so hard, and get nutrients out of it. We certainly can't do that. Termites are one of the only animals that can. It turns out they don't do this alone. Researchers are looking inside termites to figure out who's actually responsible for this feat. At the Exploratorium in San Francisco, museum biologists give the insect a little puff of carbon dioxide. When it's nice and relaxed, the termite poops itself. Under the microscope, multitudes appear. Hundreds of species of microbes live packed inside a termite's gut, about one one-thousandth of a teaspoon. This big one is called trichonympha. It's not an animal, plant, or fungus. It's a protist. Watch it move with the help of its flagella. 
Protists like Trichonympha are essential for termites to turn the wood into a source of energy. They do this by fermenting the wood, much the same way a brewer turns grain into beer. Something else is hidden deep in the termite's gut, a powerful bacterium that combines nitrogen from the air and calories from the wood to make protein. That's like turning a potato into a steak. Termites can't live without their microbes, and many of these microbes can't live outside the termite. So what if we used the microbes against their hosts? Right now, when we want to get rid of termites, we fumigate our houses with poison. But maybe we could just kill the protists instead. Louisiana State University entomologists are engineering a gut bacterium to kill gut protists. They'd sneak the bacteria into the termite colony on something the termites would eat. The bacteria would kill the protists that help the termites digest wood, leaving them surrounded by food, but starving. Hi there, it's Amy. One other thing about termites and their microbes, termites aren't born with them. Adults feed babies a kind of starter kit when they're little, the same way human moms give their babies good microbes in their breast milk. Thanks for watching. And while you're here, subscribe. All right, so that was a ginormous order of Blatodia. Let me know if you have any questions.